Donald Trump is a TV producer, and he is going to produce his performance for television. Welcome to our first episode of Let's Break It Down, where we go behind the scenes at the White House to reveal how campaign events are planned, choreographed, and executed to prevent things from going terribly wrong. I'm Alyssa Mastromonaco, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff for Barack Obama. Joining me today is Robert Gibbs, one of my oldest pals and former White House Press Secretary and Senior Advisor to Barack Obama. Hi, Gibbs! Hello, Alyssa! Since we have known each other, which is, um, hold on, six, 17 years, you and I as a team have been in charge of putting together moments. Right. Mm -hmm. Moments for Barack Obama, the senator, for the president. And one of my favorite memories and favorite pictures is the two (laughs) of us on a Nighthawk helicopter. And you and Axelrod, we get off Air Force One. The sides are open. We're over the Afghani, you know, hinterlands. And you're like, why aren't you have your vest on? And I'm like, well, if they shoot us, they're going to shoot from below. So I decided to sit on my vest. Then like one of the military guys says, yeah, yeah, she's she's probably right. It's um it's better to have it on your seat. And I'm thinking, wh- well, wh- why, didn't, why didn't somebody tell me that? Not everybody has independent thought like I do. <sighs> um, so we're here on the precipice of the presidential commission debates. These are the rizzle dizzle, so to speak. This is where uh, people actually start tuning in. Let's go back in history. Do you have a favorite moment, no matter what it was? Like just one moment where you watched it, you still remember it, you're like, fuck, that's good. Um, To me, the first probably 15 to 20 minutes of the debate in Oxford, Mississippi, uh, the first presidential debate for for Mm. us in 2008. And I kind of felt like it was sort of at the end of a really tumultuous week in the campaign. We had been losing sort of our grip um, there at the beginning of September mm-hmm. and McCain had, and, and Palin too had been kind of coming up and Lehman collapses. And, you know, it's supposed to be a foreign policy debate, but it, it ends up being right. the first 30 minutes of it end up being an economic debate, which was great for us. This is a final verdict on eight years of failed economic policies promoted by George Bush, supported by Senator McCain, uh, a theory that basically says that we can shred regulations and consumer protections and give more and more to the most, and somehow prosperity will trickle down. Uh, It hasn't worked. I think that the fundamentals of the economy have to be measured by whether or not the middle class is getting a fair shake. That's why I'm running for president. That's what I hope we're going to be talking about tonight. I think we went into that debate leading. I think we left Oxford um, and never trailed again. And to me, that was just a command power performance from then Senator Obama you know, again, I think was probably helped by that 30 minutes being first on the economy. And then, you know, he held his own in a foreign policy debate against John McCain, who was the experienced foreign policy candidate. And I think, again, that was expectation setting. If you have these headlines tomorrow that say the polls say Obama won, that certainly helped Barack Obama, especially in a debate that the first third of it was not about foreign policy, it was about the economic crisis. So is this a matter where expectations versus the reality do actually influence yeah, the way people see it? I think so. I think the McCain campaign uh, tried to really manage expectations about their their fellow, and uh, so did the Obama campaign. And clearly, he was not supposed to be the expert on foreign policy. And I felt like after that, we, we were, were good. Yeah, we were good. Well, the funny thing about that is, though, I also, and you may not remember this, but we really considered post-Labor Day, as most people do, a reboot, right? right? This is real campaign season, September's it. And we gave a speech the day after Labor Day in New Hampshire. Do you remember this? Yes, We gave a speech, (laughs) and we're like, this is it. We're back, bitches. And the fucking teleprompter blew apart. Yeah, it was terrible. But this is when the rubber really hits the road. Yeah. And like that, like you were saying, like we, even if we had fucked up the debates, we still had a couple of public events between the next debate where mm-hmm. we could bring it back, where you could show, yep. you could kind of bounce back yeah. a little bit. This campaign season is different, however, due to COVID. Joe Biden and Donald Trump don't have that extra safety net. And I've laid out a series of actions that we can take to try to get those costs down. But here's what I don't want people to forget when we're talking about reigning in the cost, which has to be uh, the highest priority of the next uh, president. Something that probably the Hillary folks could not have anticipated in 2016 um, 
though anyone who works in television could, is that Donald Trump is a producer. He's a TV right. producer. Who will succeed? Who will fail? And who will be the apprentice? And he is going to produce his performance for television, not yeah. for the moderators, yeah. not for his opponent. He is producing this shit for television. And he is thinking in his head, how do I own the stage? You know, he started out saying things that were crazy and mean. He's right. really just progressed into straight up fiction. All of the things that are happening with uh, votes by mail, thousands of votes are gathered and they come in and they're dumped in a location. It was going to hit uh, not only Florida, but Georgia it could have uh, was going toward the Gulf. I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. One, how do the moderators try to fact check him in real time, a level of cardio I am not suited for? And how does, <laughs> if you are Joe Biden or his team, how do you tell him to respond to things yeah. that are other lies? Well, I think you want to be careful that you don't become the chief fact checker for Donald Trump. I think the onus is going to be on the debate moderators like we've never seen before. I think it's brilliant to pick, for instance, Chris Wallace, who we've already seen fact check yeah. Donald Trump in an interview. Testing is up 37 percent. Well, that's 30, good. I understand. Cases are up. 194 percent. It isn't just the testing has gone up. It's that the virus has spread. The positivity rate has increased. There are many the, the of virus those cases than it was. Wallace did a lot of probably what you would do to get ready for a presidential debate. He knows the questions he's going to ask. He's seen those questions asked in in interviews before and he knows where the answer is coming. And then he can push and pivot off of that. I think what's going to be interesting is if anybody out there watches one of these presidential news conferences, the reason why you end up wanting to throw something at the television and say, I can't believe they didn't ask a better question, um, which probably happens every time somebody out there watches <laughs> one of these. Donald Trump cuts the questioner off when they've said enough of what uh, they put enough out there that he wants to answer. I'd also like to ask you about some comments you made on Friday. Uh, you were talking about governors of different states, and you said, I want them to be appreciative. Uh, you also said, if they don't treat you right, but I, didn't I don't that. call. I uh, didn't these are direct, no, direct quotes, a, sir. Excuse me. Ready? 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 Take a look at what I said. I want them to be appreciative of me, okay? And then you cut it off because it's okay. fake news. You and of your administration, Listen, just, absolutely. Please, let me just finish. The right? And so... These reporters start with these long questions where they wind up and, you, you know, sir, you, you last week you said X. And before they can even get to the next thing, he says, well, the reason I said X is because it's important to do blah, 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 blah. And then he goes to the next question. And it goes back to your producer uh, point of view on, on this. What helped Donald Trump in 2016 is he was a very unconventional candidate. It's Rubio. And I'm, I'm surprised to this point that, you know, a good three, almost four years into it, that reporters don't understand that the game's changed, right? They're not going to get a, a 45 second wind up. The, this president isn't going to listen to the entire question and play the game on the level and answer it based on your premise. He's going to listen to that question long enough to find something that he can make his point on. And then he's going to go to somebody else. He's not just wild and crazy Donald Trump. He's the president of the United States. Yes. But he's now an incumbent. Incumbents never have great luck. Right. Why do incumbents yeah. not debate great out of the gate? So this has been true, I think, for Reagan's first debate. It was mm -hmm. definitely true for George W. Bush's first debate. And as you and I painfully remember, it was all too clear from Barack Obama's first debate. Now, you know, that may not... Uh, seem like a big deal when it just is paper, uh, you know, uh, numbers on a sheet of paper. I mean, the truth is you give somebody this like terribly thick binder of everything you've said and everything he said and every policy plan you have. And in reality, you've got to structure your time so that you, you can do this all in a minute and a half or in two minutes. And presidents that have been through four years are not used to formulating these answers quite that succinctly and to understand how do I get into the issue? What am I for? What is my opponent against? 
And then how do I summarize that issue? All in like 90 to 120 seconds. They just don't, they haven't had to do that. They're just not used to sitting or standing five feet away from the other person and having that person say, Mr. President, I think you're wrong. I'm going to spend the next 90 seconds listing everything about what you're doing is wrong. I'm going to summarize it and then you're going to have to answer it. I mean, I remember once going into the into the Oval for a meeting and we're standing there in the foyer and, and somebody says, I think this is a terrible decision. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to tell him this is a terrible decision. I'm going to get him to change his mind. You know, just like, I mean, some I forget who it was. That person was all fired up. They walked in that the room and it wasn't somebody who wasn't used to being in the room, but you walk in that room, it's the Oval Office. The president is sitting where the president does, in front of the fireplace, underneath George Washington. And you know what? You don't, you don't attack the president. You don't say, well, sir, I think you're, you've got a really hideous idea. I think it's a terrible decision. But you're just not used to dealing with that. And, and, and that particular meeting, that person went in, completely laid down, agreed with the president, agreed with the decision. We walked out and I said, boy, I'd hate to see you in a meeting if you got really mad. Um, <laughs> but they're just, they're not used to this. And in reality, the mindset of each of these incumbents is, what am I doing? Why do I have to do this? This is a big waste of time, and this person does not belong to, on this stage with me. And it isn't exactly. until yeah. it isn't until they get their ass kicked in that first debate. And there's a, I was just doing a, a thing with Mark McKinnon, and Mark was reminding us of, you know, they were walking up the steps of Air Force One, and Bush thought he'd won the debate, and they're like, yeah. "Well, sir, um, you know, they stop in the cabin at the top of the stairs." And the same was true for 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 our boss in 2012, and I will never forget. I printed out the transcript and I read it later that night. And I remember I circled like the third sentence of his first answer. What are the major differences between the two of you uh, about how you would go about creating new jobs? You know, four years ago, we went through the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Millions of jobs were lost. The auto industry was on uh, the brink of collapse. Uh, the financial system had frozen up. And because of the resilience and the determination of the American people, uh, we've begun to fight our way back. Uh, over the last 30 months, we've seen 5 million jobs in the private sector created. Uh, the auto industry has come roaring back. And housing uh, has begun to rise. And I had lunch with him a few days later at the White House and, and I gave him that transcript and I said, sir, like, this is where I knew you were off. And it was the mm -hmm. third sentence of his first answer because there's no thesis to your answer and you sound like you're in a meeting in the Roosevelt Room. They, they're not ready for it. So it will be interesting to see because you said Trump's a producer and he's a performer. Does he fall into that trap? I've always said the best debate answer is not necessarily it's not one that has to be crafted based on the individual question. It is, are right. you giving the best 90 second synthesis for why you should be president of the United States and why the other person should not? And a bunch of that answer should be, in a sense, preformed. You know right. what that, that frame and that lens is. And I think that's when each of these candidates ends up being at their best. You go back in time, though, and you watch that first uh, debate from 2012, as I did. And Oof. it's just kind of amazing because our POTUS, POTUS, is uh, he's just like fucking annoyed. He's just like annoyed to be there. Like Mitt Absolutely. Romney, you are a pest in the way. Right. And, and Romney, if you look at his facial expressions, he's kind of like, am I doing this? I think I'm doing this. Like, right. He gets more and more confident as he goes along because he's like, he's like, and, and, yeah. and Obama is a good debater, like f by right. political standards, he's a good debater. And I think Romney was just like, I better make the most of this while I can. Well, and to give Romney credit, remember, remember, even at that point, there were a lot of stories that, that Romney was taking this process seriously, that he started mm -hmm. a month in advance, that he'd watched a lot of tape, that he'd done a lot of practice. And he clearly controlled the stage. He controlled the answers. He put um, he put President Obama on the defensive. Um, it, it was an impressive performance. OK, now let's get into this first Trump Biden debate. If either of them has a truly catastrophic performance since 
the one thing I think that they've both put on the line for the other is mental fitness. Right. Right. This like this debate doesn't feel a ton about or, or the campaign even doesn't feel a ton about differences in issues because we, I mean, we know that they're vast, but it's right. more like who's fit. One of the things that the Trump campaign at least has smartly stopped doing is essentially lowering Joe Biden's debate expectations from the, the White House briefing room podium. We have a sleepy guy in a basement of a house. Because, you know, they, they've literally gotten to the point where if he completes sentences, um, he will have he will have beaten their expectations of somebody who's like, what you know, he doesn't even know he's alive, I think, was something Trump said. I mean, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous on its face. But I, I mean, I think it will depend. I mean, look, that first debate will set a lot and it will put a lot of pressure on each of those candidates for the next debate. These are going to be big moments. You're going to have big audiences. Right. And. Um, and there aren't many chances, there certainly aren't many chances where you're standing in the same room, but there are very few chances to change a bit of the trajectory. And I think even though if you look at the public polling, very few people are undecided, very few people right. have not made up their mind. But I do think that these are going to be moments, particularly because we haven't had a lot of the day-to-day -day campaigning that we normally would have right. had. And these are going to be big, big, big moments. And I think there's no doubt you have to be ready. Givers, thank you for being my this was first a lot of fun. guest on Let's Break It Down. This was super fun. You might have to come back because we could talk for hours. I'm happy to. Thank you. <laughs>